Hello, everybody. It is the Locked On Big 12 Roundtable. My name is Josh Neighbors. I am the host of Locked On Big 12. If you're watching on YouTube to my right, it is Linda Godfrey. She is the host of Locked On Pokes. Below her, it is uh, Stephen Simcox. He is the host of Locked On Horn Frogs. And to his left below me, it is John Williams, the host of Locked On Sooners. Tonight, we're going to discuss the Big 12's place compared to other conferences, especially in football. And then Look at some comments about NIL and the transfer portal from one Dabo Sweeney, a very progressive thinker. We've got some ideas and thoughts on what he said uh, and all that and more coming up on tonight's show. You are locked on Big 12, your daily podcast on the Big 12 Conference, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Once again, hello, everybody. Welcome to this edition of the Locked On B12, Locked On Pokes, Locked On Sooners, Locked On Horn Frogs podcast. It is a crossover. So uh, tonight, four of us, we're going to discuss the place of the Big 12 conference. I was recently listening to an episode of the Cover 3 podcast. They were discussing Bob Bowlesby's exit and what it means to the Big 12, who would want the job what comes up next. And they hit on a point of who is the big 12 really competing with? Are they competing with the ACC, the PAC 12 trying to be a power five conference, you know, or, or in that mix, I guess of the bottom three power five conferences, or are they really battling with the AAC and Tom Fornelli, Bud Elliott, Chip Patterson and Danny Cannell all kind of agreed. It's like, yeah, they're fighting with the AAC. And I, I heard this, and I actually turned off the podcast, friends, because I was like, this is a, I understand it's a national view, but are we just going to forget, like, what happened this season? Are we going to forget that when, uh, you know, John OU is a great program, and you and I have talked, they're in a good spot moving forward with Brent Venables. Texas, God love them. They're back always. But it was Oklahoma State and Baylor, who both beat Oklahoma this year, who were in the Big 12 title game. Oklahoma State and Baylor, both beating teams at other conferences, Notre Dame and Independent, obviously, but it's a huge brand, Ole Miss as well, in you know in, uh, in New Year's Six Bowl games. And we're like, and Danny Cannell's quote, they're trying to catch up to the ACC. That was the exact quote. Steven, I'll go to you first. Like, if you just covered your eyes and every Big 12 team played this year, that statement might be true. If you watch any football, that statement is completely false. If you watch ACC football and Big 12 football this season. No, you're totally right. And my frustration when we talk about conferences and and try to power rank them is aside from the SEC, and I will concede, I think the SEC has a little more depth than normal now. But we're still really, like, because the knock on the Big 12 essentially that I think is fair is that they haven't excelled in playoff situations. And of course, really only talking about one team in there and that's Oklahoma because they've been the one that's gotten there. But when we talk about the ACC lately, if we're discussing them as a strong conference, it's been Clemson and only Clemson. And, you know, we'll see what Clemson does here in the next few years. Pitt had a really nice year last year. Um, You know, Wake Forest surprised some people, but those are schools that, I mean, traditionally are pretty similar. Um, and I would say a level below, you know, a Baylor and Oklahoma State, some of the, uh, I guess, schools that are slightly there, if we're talking about brand names behind Oklahoma and Texas. Um, you know, when we talk about the Pac 12, uh, that league has really struggled. And I guess if we were going to include one team, it would be Oregon in the playoff era. Um, the SEC, it's really Alabama and Georgia. And then I think they benefit from the fact that it seems like either LSU or Auburn kind of every, you know, once a recruiting cycle has a team that's talented enough to also be in the national conversation. Um, my concern about the big 12 moving forward, and I don't really know how to pinpoint where this failure is. I I don't want to put it all on Bob Bowlesby, but to a certain extent, like perception is reality. And I don't think on a national level, people actually pay attention and watch the conference. And like, this is a small thing, but you still see that stupid joke every time an NFL game breaks out in a shootout. And you've brought this up before Josh of like, Oh man, big 12, big 12 football on a Sunday night. 
And it's like, have you watched the Big 12 lately? Like, the identity of the league has completely changed. If anything, the gripe about the Big 12 now is they don't have any good quarterbacks. Like, it's a, it's a league that's really based on defenses and running the football and trying to protect the people under center because they're not playing particularly well. Um, this is not like the Patrick Mahomes, Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray league that we saw, you know, even five or six years ago. The, the coaches have changed. The, the way these teams are structured has changed. Uh, and I don't know how to make up for that. But it's a really lazy take. Like, I, I just y- – you poach some teams from the American Conference, and now you're competing with the American Conference. Like, these are good football programs that you're bringing in. Cincinnati was in the playoff. Houston had a really nice year under Dana Holgerson. UCF has shown some staying power. BYU was its own sort of entity out there on the West Coast and had a lot of success against the Pac-12. We we'll also right. whipped the shit out of the Pac-12 this year. Yes. Unless we forget and- that. And it's almost like the Big 12 gets punished for having parity. Like, you know, for a long time, OU it's the was most the, interesting league. Yeah. It, OU was the head of the league. Last year, they weren't. We'll see what happens moving forward. But I think because of the round robin schedule, because these teams see each other so often, and yeah, because maybe um, there's not just one team that's head and shoulders better than everyone. They, they sort of get forgotten because we, we do get so consumed by the playoff discussion. But no, to answer, to answer your question in a short way, I don't think they're competing with the American Conference. But I do worry about that becoming you know the narrative around the league because people just simply don't really pay attention to the league. That's the danger, right, Linda? I mean, as, as somebody who covers a team that was really, – you know, the conversation was, hey, Oklahoma State or Cincinnati, but – now, you know, it's not – I'm not saying either or here, but they're bringing Cincinnati into the fold. Like, who the hell in the, the AAC are, are they competing with? Bye-bye to – also to uh, Houston. Bye-bye UCF. They're gone. So, who – Memphis? Like, <laughs> like who else, Linda? Like, who, el- who else in the AAC are they competing with? Also, football and basketball, too. Like, like honestly, AAC basketball might have a better claim – at getting you know the Big Twelve, then Big Twelve, it's not a claim very much. But then Big Twelve football, <laughs> you, especially those teams added on. Yeah, well, like Stephen said, it's all about narrative, and unfortunately, we fall on a negative spectrum on that. In in any kind of conversation, Big Twelve is is thought of of some like laughing stock. You can't. We're not as bad as some place, but we're not as good as another place. And I find that comical. OU, Baylor, Oklahoma State, we're all in the conversation late into the season for playoff contention. Cincinnati made it to the playoffs. Sure, they got their asses kicked, but they made it. OU's been more there. competitive been than some there. teams were against Alabama. Yeah, we've been we've been there before, but like the idea that it's some poor conference is absolutely insane to me. And you said like the clip was gonna piss me off. So I'm actually kind of glad that you just summarized for us and I didn't have to listen to it. Uh, John. So, uh, you know, I'll ask you as somebody who had Lincoln Riley, like the PAC 12 is prompted up by a prop, excuse me, propped up by Phil Knight because Oregon, we're not sure what they are. And, you know, like, I mean, we have got no clue what new Oregon looks like under Dan Lanning and Lincoln Riley at USC. Those. Are the, and once again, like, I think USC gets good eventually, but like when, what what tells us that USC Lincoln Riley looks any different than OU Lincoln Riley when they play LSU right yeah. or in Alabama? Like, will they still get their asses kicked in the line of scrimmage? That's still the big question. So, you know, when when you hear this stuff about and you know you covered OU this year and see you know, they weren't in the Big Twelve championship game and it, you know it wasn't a fluke or anything. It's just there were some teams that were better this year. They just got beat. When, yeah, it's got beat. And so you hear this, you think about like okay. Like what's Clemson who just got rated of both their coordinators rightfully so. Cause they're very good coaches props up the ACC, a new coach and Phil Knight are propping up the PAC 12. What the hell are we talking about here? I mean, this is what the kind of middle America slash Texas media has argued for years. It's the West coast, East coast media bias. You know, as soon as Lincoln Riley got to USC, all of a sudden, Lincoln Riley was interesting, and everybody wanted to have him on their show, whether it was ESPN or Fox Sports. Colin Coward, in particular, was the biggest Lincoln Riley homer of all time all of a sudden as soon as he got to USC because it makes West Coast 
college football more interesting, which means more ratings for West Coast media products, which means more money. And so there's just going to be a lot more interest to those teams on the coast because they want those those programs to be better and they want those conferences to be better. I will say, yeah, you know, Oklahoma or sorry, the Big 12 is in that kind of second tier behind the SEC and the Big 10. Uh, Mm -hmm. But really in the Big 10, what are we talking? Mostly it's Ohio State. Yes, you had a Michigan jump up. You had a Michigan State one time make the playoff. But really it's Ohio State and kind of everybody else. And so I think, like everybody's talking, the, the Big 12 does get punished a little bit because of its parity, but also because of its location. Pe- I think people just don't take Middle America as seriously as it should, which is weird because you look at Texas in particular, it is the hottest right. recruiting bed in all of football. And, right. I mean, everybody is clamoring for Texas high school kids, and yet the schools that come from there, you know, for currently – in the big 12 about to add Houston, they're not considered as, as much of a football conference or much of a football power as the ACC kind of odd to me. I mean, maybe Miami gets a little bit, a little bit better with Mario Cristobal and the ACC starts to get a little bit more competition for Clemson, but we'll see. I mean, Miami hasn't really been a serious program for what, 20 years now uh, since the early two thousands, it's, it's hard to remember them like competing on a national stage so I think a lot of it just comes down to the fact that East Coast, West Coast, they want those programs that they're, they have vested interests in to be good and those conferences to be, be really good. And they're going to promote them as much as they possibly can because it's going to get more ratings, more advertising, and more money for those networks. I think the Big 12 is, is in a great shape in the future, even after Oklahoma and Texas leaves, to have a very competitive conference. I think people quickly forget that it was politics that had led to Cincinnati, Houston, uh, and really Cincinnati and Houston in particular being outside Mm. of the quote-unquote power conferences. I mean, Houston could have been a Big 12 member long ago, but they weren't because of politics. Cincinnati was in the Big East, which was a power conference at one point in time, especially the 2000 to 2010 run but with Michael Vick at Virginia Tech and Matt Ryan at Boston College. Those were fantastic programs in those 2000 to 2010 years. I mean, great football came out of the Big East before it dissolved. And it's not Cincinnati's fault that the Big East couldn't run itself and they ended ended up outside of the Power Five. It's just politics. That's where that comes from. Now Cincinnati's back. Houston's in a major media market. They're going to be great. UCF has shown that they can build a program out in Orlando, Florida, of all places. And BYU has consistently been a, a really good team for the last, what, two decades? I mean, I still have nightmares of seeing BYU pummel Sam Bradford at AT AT&T Stadium and breaking his his collarbone in a season that they were supposed to contend for potentially a national title. And so people are sleeping on these teams that that the Big 12 brought in as, yes, they were AAC teams or BYU and independent. They're still really strong football programs with rich histories. And again, it was politics that kept them where they were for so long. And while it may not be all Bob Bowlesby's fault for where the Big 12 is on a national level, I think that they could have had a little bit more aggression in expanding the conference to create a little bit more competition in the Big 12. And then it's draft season, and so that's a hot topic right now, and a lot of people are looking at what does the Big 12 produce as far as NFL draft talent. College Football right. News put out their top – you know, they ranked all every program from one to 130 uh, just this week. And if you look at the top 25 programs in producing NFL talent over the last five years, the Big 12 just had one school in the top 25, and that was Oklahoma. Texas was just outside the top 25 with uh, at number 26. But then you look at the rest of the, the conferences, and SEC leads the way with seven teams, ACC with six, Pac 12 with five, Big 10 with five. And again, some of that could just be the national narrative about these players in the big 12, because we look at him like a guy like Nick Bonito, who should be one of the better pass rushers in consideration in the NFL draft. And he's being projected as a second and third rounder by most places, even though he's had good production, he's got good traits. I think that's the case for a lot of big 12 players, Jalen Petrie, who had a fantastic year at Baylor. And Terrell one of the, Bernard too. Terrell Bernard, one is, of the yeah. couple of the best defenders in the big 12 are getting slighted a little bit. I think partly because of this national narrative that's at, at play. Uh, I'm just going to read you guys this. Arizona, 24-16 win for BYU. Uh, number 21, Utah, 26-17 win. 
Number 19, Arizona State, 27-17 win. Uh, Washington State on the road, 21-19 win for BYU. Uh, Virginia, uh, 66-49 win. At USC, 35-31 win. Only loss against a Power 5 team for BYU last year, Baylor. All right? So, like, can we can we save it? And also Cincinnati uh, in, 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 you know, in the college ball playoff, UCF had a little thing, you know, at their 17 national championship, whatever the hell it was. But, like, let's, let's just, like, face this. Like, they're not competing with the AAC. I work – so I worked Pac-12 show a lot and – uh, at Sirius XM and like they, you know, they're trying to talk about how to get nationally relevant again. Okay. The big 12 placed two teams in, into, into you know, those bowl games last year and won them both and in, into New Year's six bowl games, won them both. And none of them were, were Texas or Oklahoma. So like this is, it, I mean, I'm not sure how we fight it, but it's something that, you know, when we talk about college football in a general sense, yeah. The Big 12, number one, needs playoff expansion. It's so – it is so abhorrent that the Pac-12 and ACC and Big 10 uh, hold on to this dumb alliance crap where they're like – or excuse me, um, Pac-12, ACC, yeah, 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 and Big 10, yeah, where it's like we're not going to expand this thing. It's dumb because, I mean, I'm not sure what the Pac-12 is doing. Like, I, I really just don't understand this at all. Once again, Pac-12. And then also ACC – Mentioned before Clemson getting both their co- their coordinators robbed, and we'll get to some of Dabo's comments because I'm not sure how long he is for this ten win position all the time. Uh, you know, if he keeps treating things the way he does, but the, everything's changing. We should expand the playoff and expand the playoff. The Big Twelve is very much alive. In a four team though, so let's just say it still says four teams. The Big Twelve is as viable as the Pac twelve is or the ACC is. Clemson played Iowa State this year. In a bowl game, they weren't not they were not involved. All right, I was there. Pitt played Wake. God loved both those teams. It was awesome. Then neither team had a shot at the playoff. So, like, what we talk about here with guess whose championship game mattered for potentially college football playoff spot? Ours did. The Big 12s did. Not the ACC and not the Pac-12. So save it, please save it. Let's go, That's- Josh. I'm just, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. We were like, I fight with the AAC. With who? Who are we fighting with? Well, Memphis? Who else? Who else is in the conference? And it's no fault of the Big South 12. South Florida? But so much, I mean, constantly, everybody, the only thing everybody talks about is OU in Texas. When it's a much deeper conference than that. When Oklahoma loses games to Iowa State or Kansas State in, in certain seasons, or this year, Oklahoma State and Baylor. Like, there are teams other than Oklahoma and Texas, especially Texas when you're a five-win team, you're not the be-all, end-all of the conference. Oklahoma, I love them, love them to death. They're the, the top team, generally speaking, in this conference, but even they can't make it through a season clean. It's been a long time since Oklahoma's run the table in the Big 12 and finished a season undefeated because of the depth of the conference. There's always a team that ends up sneaking up and getting I wouldn't even say sneaking up. They get them because they're a good quality football program. Well, the other thing that frustrates me, too, is when we talk about the Big 12 and so much of the discussion last year when everybody thought the league was going to dissolve was like, well, there's just not enough TV markets. Like, what is this, 1974? Like, we're not talking Three about channels. we're not talking about TV markets anymore. Like, we're not talking about sweeps and, you know, um, quarterly ratings. Like, everybody's streaming everything. You know, market yourself. Like, get somebody in as a commissioner who can market that this is a really good league with teams that have passionate fan bases. I mean, maybe it's not the uh, biggest brand names in the world, but Iowa State fans are really crazy. They love their team. Oklahoma State fans love their team. God love them. West Virginia fans fill up my mentions every time I make a joke about the fact that they don't have internet access. They love their football teams and, and programs. Like, it's a league with good competition, with uh, people that care about what's going on, with people that will be willing to pay to watch the content and – you know, get the service, like market that and stop, like stop propping up the fact that, um, you know, taxes is underachieving, like promote the fact that there are other teams in the league that are improving and doing better. Linda, you got anything else on this? Maybe final word. Fine. But I do concede that making fun of Texas for not playing well is fun. Oh, so I'm yeah, not going to stop sure. doing that, but I can sure. also prop up other teams. It's just like the point of like, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do about about five and seven Texas? 
I mean, <laughs> God knows what we're going to do. Guys, I bet on Texas to win that final game, and I, I was happy they did against Kansas State. But, like, they were fighting for a fifth win against Texas Tech – or, excuse me, against Kansas State on a Black Friday. I think 12 people were there. Nobody goes to their games. It's, it's just like, got to have got Texas. Got to have – no. We don't have to have Texas. They lost to every good team in the league. Who do they – they they beat TCU in a fun game in September. Sorry. They didn't beat Kansas, which and is they, they, they didn't beat Kansas. They didn't beat OU. They didn't beat Iowa State. They didn't beat Oklahoma State. They didn't beat Baylor. All right? They did not beat any of those teams. So it's like, what are we going to do when the Longhorns leave? Oh, what are we going to do when their half-empty stadium gets to see Gary Jennings giving the horns down from West Virginia? God, I mean, put the fear of God into us when we lose them. Sure, it's a huge brand. Enjoy it, SEC. They're going to go 4-8 and eight in the SEC West, wherever you stick them. I mean, I, I would think Sark's going to do well. But, like, this – it's just – it pisses me off so much that we have to deal with – I mean, is, you know, are they going to have to worry about SMU and and, uh, and worry about Memphis? No. No, they're not going to have to worry about SMU and Memphis. Like, the Pac-12 sucks, and we're like – can the Big 12 be as good as, you know, uh, the ACC, which has got Louisville and Syracuse? Yes. I, th- I think they're going to be okay. Yeah. I think yeah. the Big 12 they, will beat their ass they every time they be, played them. They should add SMU and in, in, in Memphis, in my opinion. Yeah, the I only think, two teams were the damn. That's yeah. why I keep bringing them up. Yeah. I think it'd be also, fun. Also, why should I care about revenue? Like, I'm going to be poor either way. This money doesn't go in my pocket. It's <laughs> like all these SEC fans are like, well, we have big content. Like, Aggies, God love you. I mean, you, you're in a cult. It's fine. I get it. You're spending all this oil money on big-time recruits. Good luck. I still think you're going to finish third in the SEC West. But, like, stop bragging about your TV contracts. It's not going to you. It's not like a local right. church. Like, it's not coming back into your pocket. It's you're just league. watching the games. I'm really looking forward to figuring out how Jimbo Fish is going to play six defensive linemen out of the 2022 class. <laughs> it's, it's a great question. It's also it's also one for uh, for Texas as well. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually split this up into two episodes because we got to talk about – we're getting more angry about this uh, – what Davo Sweeney said. So we're going to record a second episode about NIL and the transfer portal and how about it's ruining the game that we love because these damn kids don't know what's good for them. That's coming up next. So make sure you guys check out that one as well. Uh, that part two is coming up here uh, of, of our of our crossover. Josh Neighbors, Linda Godfrey, Stephen Simcox, and John Williams. Part two coming at you. Find it wherever you guys get your podcast.